start. Robert Lefnow, who we met last night, argues in his most recent book that while the demographic center of Christianity is shifting to the global south, the organizational and material resources of global Christianity remain heavily concentrated in North America, as well as some of Europe. He argues that missiologists have not sufficiently appreciated the expanding role of American congregations, and especially American megachurches, in shaping global Christianity. Megachurches and their pastors are forging influential new patterns of North American congregational involvement in global mission. Their influence on mission patterns often surpasses the influence of denominational leaders, mission executives, or leading missiologists. And yet, neither missiological scholarship nor in the emerging new research on megachurches do we find a systematic treatment of megachurch involvement in global mission. This article attempts to address this in Kuna. Late in 2007, together with Doug Wilson and Adel Johnson, uh, I developed a 113-item survey on congregational involvement in global mission, which was sent to the person in charge of missions at 1,230 megachurches, reported as averaging 2,000 or more in weekend worship. Twelve surveys were returned as undeliverable, with additional follow-up, 547 surveys were returned for a response rate of 45%. However, only 405 respondents reported that their church had an average week, uh, weekend attendance of 2,000 or more. And since this is the commonly accepted definition of a megachurch, the data in this article is drawn exclusively from this set of 405 megachurches. These churches had an average mean weekend worship attendance of 4,312 and a median attendance of 3,100. Median means that half of all churches are this size or larger, half of this size or smaller. The following shows the size distributions. So you'll see that a third of the churches are between 2,000 and 2,500 and slightly under 2% were over 15,000. So this is the distribution of the sample that I'm working with here. Nearly half of these churches are from the south, with 24% from the west, 24% from the midwest, and only 5% from the northeast. 37% reported being non-denominational, with 20% Southern Baptist, 6% Assemblies of God, 5% United Methodist, 2% each for Calvary Chapel, ELCA, and Foursquare Gospel, and so on. 59% were founded prior to 1971, with 14% founded after 1990. The average 2007 total reported expenditure per church was $6,869,000. Perhaps the simplest measure uh, of commitment to global mission that we uh, attempted to get at was the answer to the question, what is the approximate dollar amount of all of your church's expenditures in support of ministries and needs outside the United States in 2007. The average amount, the mean, was $690,900, uh, $690, which comes to, if you average it out, just over 10% of total annual expenditures. So on average, these churches are tithing to ministries abroad. But there was wide variability in the percentage. A uh, few churches, 5%, are allocating more than 25% uh, uh, of their total expenditures toward ministry abroad. 15% uh, are giving less than 2%. But if you add it all together, it averages out as slightly over 10%. Clearly, many U.S. megachurches are committing sizable portions of their resources to ministries abroad. An alternative and traditional way of measuring congregational involvement to the commitment to mission is to ask how many long-term missionaries serving outside the USA does your church support financially. The following chart provides uh, the, the, the numbers, uh, kind of the breakdown. And you'll see here that the uh, 
the median, half of all churches said they support 16 or fewer uh, long-term missionaries. Some supported a lot more, so when you added it all together, divided it out, they averaged 31 missionary units that were being supported, long-term units. When asked to the highest amount of uh, annual support given to any one missionary or missionary family, the median was 12,000. After all, churches said $1,000 a month is the most we give, and the mean was 18,000, so half, uh, so uh, 1,500. Many of these churches were commit, are committed to supporting career missionaries, with 61% of respondents either agreeing or strongly agreeing that Western career missionaries are strategically important at this time and should be generously supported. Of course, this means 39% disagree, or, or very mildly agree with the statement. 45% agreed that, quote, our church is reluctant to support long-term missionaries who are not members of our church. Those agreeing with this statement provide support to fewer long-term missionaries. So if they say we only support people from our church, those churches didn't support as many long-term missionaries. And they don't support the ones that they support at any higher level than anybody else. So there's still over 18,000. That's the highest amount they will support. Naturally, if, if you take Kant's categorical imperative, that whatever principle you have wouldn't really work if everybody applied it. If all churches adhered to this principle while giving at this level, then there would be virtually no missionary able to achieve full support through congregational giving if that was practice of all churches. Financial support for career missionaries now competes against newer priorities. With support for career missionaries, a shrinking proportion of total expenditures. In the survey, respondents were asked to, numer to numerically compare the changes at their church in the last five years in five areas, with the answer large increase, coded as a plus one, a decrease as a negative one, an unchanged or slight increase coded as zero. Since people tend to be optimistic, I code a slight increase as zero. On each of five areas, more churches claimed a large increase than claimed a decrease. But the one area where this was barely true related to increase in support of career missionaries. Strong increases in average church attendance were more than matched by strong increases in total financial expenditures for ministries outside of the United States. Um, you know, total, total church income and total church expenditures for ministry outside of the United States. And more than matched by growth in support of short-term missions. But this increase in total, in total financial resources did not get shown in support of long-term missionaries. There was barely more churches saying, yes, we increased than uh, the um, in short, the large increase in expenditures for ministry abroad not channeled into the corresponding increase of career missionaries. There's a congregational softening of support for full-time missionaries. Doubtless one factor in the recent decline in the total number of Protestant full-time missionaries in the U.S. What, this is one of the areas I would say what now is book is mistaken. Uh, he's uh, number one. If you look at the Protestant Mission Handbook, even the statistics he's looking at are plateaued. I would argue, rather than increasing the last few years, and his data does not come from the latest Protestant Mission Handbook, which tracks data for the last three years, up to a year or so ago, with a one percent decline each year. That is. Uh, it, uh, in Canada, there's been a steady decline as short term has exploded. Uh, career looks like it has plateaued, and uh, at least the numbers that are there have been declining. The evidence here is that there is this one group, and I've got a lot of other evidence, that there is a softening of support for career missionaries. You can talk to people in this room, uh, with, with missionaries or whatever, and they can talk to you about the challenge of maintaining support on the field when churches are redirecting uh, their uh, expenditures. In 2007, mega churches sent a median of 100 and a mean of 159 people abroad on church and mission trips, organized and sponsored by their church. The following provides the distribution of each, uh, each uh, the numbers of participants per uh, church. So you find that 
two out of 405 churches said, no, we don't organize any mission trips abroad. So 99.5% say, yes, we do organize mission trips abroad. Uh, a few of them are less than 20 people that go. There's a small group, 4%, who, who uh, have more than 500, some up to a couple thousand in a given year. Roughly 3.7% of those in a mega church on a given week, 3.7% of everybody, not just of adults, of everybody, uh, on a given weekend traveled abroad on a short term mission trip in 2007. The number of people traveling on a domestic mission trip of two days or more, organized and sponsored by their church, was slightly lower, with a median of 70 per church. So a median of 100 versus a median of 70. There's a few outliers that I have of churches that claim uh, many, many thousands going on short term mission trips. I'm not sure that they're, they read my question carefully. So I, I chose the medium for this one. Fully 94% of mega church high school youth programs organize short term mission trips abroad for their youth, with 78% doing so one or more times per year. Robert Wethna estimates that nearly a third of all U.S. missions funding is currently channeled in support of short term missions. With an annual mega church average of 159 short term mission participants traveling abroad, expending an average of $1,400 per traveler. Let's now mention kind of a conservative guess, maybe a thousand per traveler. I've got data on several thousand mission trips, and it's, it's almost certainly in the neighborhood of 1,400 per traveler. It's going to be slightly higher. This comes, uh, if you run these numbers, it does come, in my data as well, to 32% of total reported mega church annual expenditures directed abroad, seemingly confirming Wathnow's estimate that approximately a third of expenditures are changed this way. Prior research has shown that the majority of mission trips abroad are for less than two weeks, and that most short-term missionaries travel in groups ranging from a small handful up to a couple hundred or more. Our megachurch survey asked which destination country received the most short-term missionaries from their church in 2007. If one lists in order the top 10 country destinations for megachurches, short-term missions, and contrasts this with the top destinations for U.S. tourists and top destinations for study abroad, a number of fruitful observations can be made. Tourism, our middle column here, uh, prioritizes Europe, countries with beach resorts, and uh, major Asian countries more than those short-term missions. Study abroad, if you look over here, is very Eurocentric, with a couple of ex exceptions. STM, at least uh, run by mega churches, is not Eurocentric. The only top 10 STM destination, which is also a top 10 destination for tourism or study abroad, is Mexico. Doubtless due to its size and propinquity to the US. That is, the divergence in destinations would suggest that motivations for short term <coughs> missions diverge from motivations for tourism or study abroad. They overlap, and there's a lot of anxieties people have about are we tourists, are we short termers? This, the groups I looked at in Peru. Some of them did some tourism stuff. A lot of them didn't do as much tourism as I thought they should. They weren't interested in the culture. They just wanted to get the job done. Um, one clear focus of STM is on regions which are less markedly well-off material. The following pie chart shows the overall breakdown in megachurch STM destinations and hints at another key distinctive of um, short-term missions. Mega church SDM trips are primarily going to countries which Philip Jenkins identifies as the new centers of global Christianity. The country with the highest number of mega church visitors per capita is Guatemala, a country which the Pew Foundation uh, study recently reported has a population that is 60% charismatic with Pentecostal Christian. This is charismatic within the Catholic Church as well as that. Similarly, Top STM destinations in Africa feature heavily Christian countries like Uganda, South Africa, or Kenya, not Chad, Mauritania, or Niger. If we examine these STM country destinations in terms of David Barrett and Todd Johnson's typology, distinguishing world A, the third of the world that's least evangelized, world B, the somewhat evangelized countries of the world, world C, countries that are most Christian, 
we discovered that 6% of megachurches are focusing their SDM on countries in world A, the least Christian portions of the world, 12% on world B, and fully 82% on the third of the world that is world C, it's most uh, Christian. That is short term, this is where Roth now is saying, what are we doing? We're partnering, we're finding congregations, that's what we're finding people we can go work with. That is, short-term mission teams are not primarily going into spaces where there are no Christians, but are channeling most of their efforts into regions where Christianity is numerically strong. Short-term mission trips involve collaboration with local Christians and missionaries in partnership projects designed to strengthen local churches and their witness. While STM trips frequently combine multiple activities, they're not just doing one thing often, uh, the following, in order of frequency from highest to lowest, were the reported activity foci of megachurch. Whoops. Okay, it's in the paper. If you've got a copy, you can see it. I didn't get it here. Building construction repair is number one, followed closely by evangelism, church planning, VBS children's ministries, medical health care, relief and development, orphans, orphanages, vision trip, prayer walk, music, worship, teaching English, education, not English, sports, art, drama, environmental and justice issues. And all of these show up as priorities for different churches. While the second item on the list is evangelism or church planning, the evidence suggests this is usually done, other evidence in the survey is usually done in partnership with local Christians. Uh, often it's simply one of your activities. You're doing construction and you're doing a little English teaching and you're conceptualizing it as ministry and outreach, but you yourself are not doing your full-time door-to-door evangelism for, for at least some of these. All of the other activities on the list that seem to involve strengthening and supplementing the witness of local churches rather than serving as independent efforts to evangelize in regions with minimal Christian presence. Rather than megachurch SDM teams going from spaces where there is Christianity to spaces where there is not, megachurch SDM teams are going from places where Christianity is present and has comparative material wealth and going to spaces where Christianity is present in the midst of relative material constraint. Only 4% of megachurches listed a country for their largest STM destination, which the International Monetary Fund identifies as an advanced economy. The Japans of the world are the minority uh, focus of this. With 96% identifying their primary STM destination as one which the IMF lists as emerging and developing economies. To summarize, SDM destinations are affected by how close the country is. Mexico is the number one SDM destination for 74 mega churches. Whether there is a tourism infrastructure, liquidity of travel, accommodation, safety. Uh, Kenya has much better tourism infrastructure than some other parts of Africa. And they get a lot more short term uh, So these structures that enable these brief trips. The extent to which there is a Christian presence at the destination site and the extent to which there is a marked economic difference in the destination and the, uh, the point of departure. That is, it would appear that megachurch SDM is largely a paradigm of partnership, a paradigm for connecting Christians in resource-rich portions of the world with Christians in regions of poverty and joint projects of witness and service. The following diagram, based on per capita funding expenditures of a fairly typical SDM church construction team to prove, this is data, I mean, I've got hard data on this, this is not an imaginary, just so story. Visually illustrates the funding structure of STM. The majority of the, so here, this is for each short-termer, for this team of 33 and each short-termer ranks 1,500 to go to Peru, and that's where the money went. Uh, $9,900 went to the airline. The biggest beneficiary of short-term missions is airline. Right? Uh, $265, they went no budget. They weren't in the hotel, they stayed in the church, the church put them up, fed them, and so on. So this 10-day trip, $265, $25 sightseeing. Uh, they spent one afternoon at the Indian market, they went to a uh, folk festival dance one evening. That was it. I mean, they were here to work and uh, party. Local transportation, uh, $25. It was a construction team, the number one thing short-termers do. And they brought $285. Each short-termer raised the equivalent of $285 for a resource transfer to help the church 
uh, with this building uh, project. The majority of financial research is going into the support of the North American traveler, in this case 81%, with the remaining 19% directly contributing to a benefit for the partnering church. Uh, if we're simply measuring in terms of resources to benefit the church, uh, in terms of resource transfer, 81% of overhead uh, for getting a benefit to the church would appear to be rather excessive. Of course, each STM traveler is also donating free labor. In this instance, 50 hours of labor. In attempting to calculate the value of STM labor, Robert Wethnow has used the independent sector, a source in Washington, D.C., that says you should count each volunteer hour as worth $20, which in this case would mean that each STM participant with 50 hours is contributing $1,000 of free labor to the host church in Peru and would indicate then that the host church received a total value of $1,285 through the presence of an STM or funded with $1,500. However, the team of 33 STM participants that I described here included 32 people who had no experience with construction. Furthermore, were the Peruvian church to simply contract local professional laborers for the same task, they would pay $1 an hour, not $20 an hour. 50 hours of labor in Lima, thus is a $50 value, not a $1,000 value. Each STM participant on the above team, funded the $1,500 from the U.S., contributed labor worth $50 locally, and contributed an extra $285 of cash toward construction costs. So if you're in the U.S. thinking of the value of that, $285, that's not much, that's 14 hours of labor, that's 50 hours of labor I contributed. No, you contributed 50 hours of labor, but you paid for 285 hours of labor. So, I mean, the perception of what the real value is here often is, is not sufficiently understood. Uh, of course, this, so, that, so now you've got a, a value of $335 per short term to this church. Of course, this gift of $335 value is just above the average monthly salary in the and close to twice the median pastoral salary in the Protestant class. Uh, and multiplied by 33 gives a significant total value of $11,000 to the Peruvian partner church. This is the equivalent to a three year average salary of Lima and is deeply appreciated by Peruvian partners. If one subtracts this value to Peruvian partners, the 11000 from the total amount the commission team raised, the 49500 the other, what, what's the other 38000 good for? It, I think should be understood as benefiting the North American Church of Participant and their sending church. Uh, while older models of mission involve more purely altruistic expenditures not designed to serve the sending church, STM as a paradigm of mission makes the interests of the North American sending church at least as central, if not more so, than the interests of those being served. This is part of youth ministry, this team I'm looking at. This money is spent for the, for the internal discipleship ministry of the North American church. That's why you're doing it. Uh, but you're also benefiting the Peruvian church. Uh, of course, it's all in the name of mission. Uh, in the conclusion of his research report on emerging patterns of congregational life and leadership in the developing world, Donald Miller ends with what he calls an immodest proposal that every church in the United States should create a relationship with the church in the developing world. And indeed, as this data shows, such church-to-church -church partnerships are already widespread. In our own survey, 94% of megachurch mission leaders agreed that American churches should work to establish partnership relations with congregations in other countries. Fully 85% reported that their congregation has one or more church-to-church -church partnership relationships with congregations abroad. These partnerships often entail resource sharing, with 58% of megachurches reporting that resourcing under-resourced churches in other countries is a priority for them. 86% disagree with the old indigeneity principle that I also somewhat disagree with, that American Christians should not share material resources with indigenous ministries since this creates dependence on this complex issue that most of the partnership people are saying, no, we don't buy into that old indigeneity logic. Mega churches directly support a median of five national Christian workers in other countries. 
with an average maximum support of 8,600 uh, for the week. So if you're a North American, you can support, you can get as much as 1,500 a month. If you're Dominican Republic or uh, Paraguay, at most uh, 8,600. It appears likely that some of these national Christian workers are supported in the context of church-to-church -church partnerships. Furthermore, 48% of mega churches act as their own sending agency for some or all of the missionaries which they support. A significant minority of mega churches, 24%, will not support long term missionaries unless they agree to host short term mission teams from their own church. Uh, Dr. Pluman, my colleague, you know, got on the mission committee of his church, the first job of the mission committee, we're going to cut a lot of long term missionaries. That will free up money for our own. Uh, projects, and we'll cut the missionaries that don't work with our short termers. And so there's a Bible translator in Colombia who's willing to work with short termers, but it's too dangerous for short term. Okay, let's cut it. Uh, and so John Fluman had to jump up and down and scream and say, we can't do this. Uh, so that missionary had John Fluman on the board. Most of the time, you don't have a veteran missionary on the board fighting for you. You only have a lot of people on the mission committee who've done short term missions or mission junkies. Uh, okay. <laughs> you'll hear bias is coming right in. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it appears that a significant number of long-term missionaries are supported within the context of partnership ministries initiated and planned by the supporting U.S. megachurch. Megachurch mission pastors and churches with church-to-church -church partnership report higher numbers of mission trips which they themselves have been on. So if you're going to have a church-to-church -church partnership, you need people at the home church that are moving back and forth to, to coordinate and, and run for The higher the number of mission trips which mission pastors have traveled on, the more national Christian workers which their church supports. That is, there appears to be a widespread pattern of church-to-church -church partnerships supervised and monitored by highly mobile megachurch mission pastors, enabled by field missionaries and national Christian leaders, funded from U.S. congregational base, linked through short-term mission trips, and carried out as an extension of the U.S. megachurch and its vision for ministry. The following, in order of priority, were reported to be the prioritized concerns of U.S. megachurch. So starting with uh, church planting, missions to the unreached, evangelizing the Muslim world, medical missions, theological resources, and the of poverty, local Spanish language ministries, more crew missionaries, poverty in the U.S., ministry of Latin American America, Bible translation, and so on, down to uh, La Bonoya at the bottom. Yeah, sorry. Where am I? I'm sorry, I kind of lose track of what I'm doing. Um, a number of observations can be made about the above. First, church planning and evangelizing the unreached are said to be the highest values with evangelizing the Muslim world at close third. If we ask about total financial expenditures abroad, the country receiving the most mega church expenditures, only 12% prioritize country and world A, the least Christian regions, 35% world B, and the somewhat evangelized, 53% world C, the most evangelized. That is, the fact that short term mission teams are even more exclusively focused on countries with a strong Christian presence, while still reporting that the primary uh, focus of the mission team is evangelism and church planning, would seem to indicate that many churches are simply thinking of all non Christians as unreached and that any project with evangelism or witness focus can thus be coded as prioritizing the unreached, even though in actual fact uh, it might be better understood as a partnership activity. The fact that most mega churches see Bible translation as a relatively low priority would also suggest that most of these churches are not orienting their mission commitments, their funding commitments, to the least Christian portions of the world. On the other hand, 7% of megachurches, namely primarily, primarily Muslim countries, receiving the largest total expenditures. So there is a significant minority of megachurches focused on ministry in the least Christian portions of the world. Factor analysis shows there was a tendency for churches to have clusters of priorities which correlated highly with each other. One such cluster included social justice abroad, social justice in the USA, racial reconciliation, the global sex trade, environmental concerns, and religious dialogue, poverty abroad, uh, and in the US. These items can thus form a measure we could name as mission with social engagement. A second cluster includes missions to the unreached, evangelizing the Muslim world, Bible translation, 
and may be labeled mission as gospel communication. These two factors are independent of each other statistically, with megachurches varying in terms of whether they score high on one or the other, both or neither. That is, just to say it's high in social engagement does not tell you whether it's low on evangelism or high on evangelism. Those two vary independently of each other. You can be high on both, low on both, high, uh, they, they were not statistically correlated. Um, but within the clusters, higher correlation. Uh, Mega churches will score higher mission as social engagement and more supportive of church to church partnerships abroad. They're less concerned that sharing resources will create dependency. While those scoring high on mission as gospel communication tend to be less supportive of partnerships. More concerned that sharing resources will create dependency. Older churches score higher on mission as gospel communication, higher. Younger churches score slightly higher on mission as social engagement, though not at a statistically significant level. A high score on mission as gospel communication correlates positively with a commitment to supporting more career missionaries. It's a pretty strong correlation. So if you, if you say the communication of a message, to the least reached is a high priority, you're much more likely to say, and we really support career missionaries. But if, they, if these are languages, other languages, I mean, short-term missionaries clearly uh, can do it, whereas development projects can kind of be muddled through without effective communication. Um, where am I? Uh, so high commitment to mission as gospel communication with frequency of mission conferences, with email circulation of mission attorney, with an interest in partnering with mission agencies, responsive to our concerns. Uh, and with the belief that mission agencies are in a better position than our congregation, why is it a real missionary? By contrast, none of those above is correlated positively with commitment to mission and social engagement. Uh, those that have high commitments to mission and social engagement versus low, uh, it makes no difference to whether you think career missionaries are a good thing. Uh, in short, megachurch uh, mission and social engagement does not appear to have a close connection with the career missionary enterprise. I'm going to skip the next paragraph for the sake of time. Megachurches have large full-time ministerial staffs as seen in the following chart. Uh, this chart does not include clerical clear, or maintenance staff. Uh, so you have here very few of the churches of 2000 about have a pastoral staff, ministerial staff. This includes, it's not just ordained, but it's people who are full-time ministry, youth ministers, women's ministry directors. Uh, so very few have seven or less. You see a lot between seven and 50 on up to uh, uh, some that are 50 and above. In some ways, megachurches are structurally less like small single pastor congregations. I had a colleague say, how can, the, how can everybody have a relationship with the pastor in a megachurch? So there's not the pastor. It's like our seminary. There's uh, 36 of them that are doing the full, anyway. Uh, and indeed, the full-time ministerial staffs are on average larger than the faculties of ATS accredited seminaries. And just as a seminary may have one or more faculty members devoted to missions, so many mega churches have some of the pastoral staff designated as a missions pastor. I found churches, for example, Methodist Church in Texas. They have a full-time missions pastor and a full-time youth missions pastor. So 11,000 member congregation, uh, a full-time person just organizing, planning, leading the youth mission. In our survey, directly the person in charge of missions at each congregation, 4% of the respondents were senior pastors. They said, if it's a survey about my church, I will fill it up. 5.5% uh, were lay leaders, 17% were other, and 73.3% self-identified as a mission pastor. That is roughly 33 quarters of many churches have a full-time person on the pastor staff focused on global mission, or it can be a combination of global domestic mission. Mission pastors have had extensive experience with short-term missions, having taken an average of 25 mission trips abroad, and with only 1% reporting that they've never traveled on a short-term mission trip. By contrast, uh, uh, just over a third of mission pastors say they have served abroad on a full-time basis, 9.3% for less than two years, 28% for two years or more. Again, most mission pastors report either that they do not speak a second language at all, one quarter of them, 26%, or not well, 46%, another half, with only 18% saying they speak a second language very well, and 10% well. 
that is, less than a third of mission pastors appear to be functionally bilingual. Perhaps not surprisingly, bilingualism is clearly correlated with having served as a full-time missionary. So if you've not served as a full-time missionary, you're clustered over here and not speaking enough. Maybe you had Spanish in high school and you can say, oh, la buena noche, I said something like that. Uh, but the, the, the subset who've done two or more years of missions, I think there's some probably in this room who served as long-term missionaries, those are much more likely to be bilingual. 11% report they've never taken an academic course in missions or missiology. 22% have a missions degree. 67% say, well, I've had at least one course, and we don't know how many other courses they've had. Not surprisingly, those who serve as full-time missionaries are more likely to have studied missiology. Mission pastors who serve as full-time missionaries are more likely to serve in churches that regularly schedule mission conferences, that actually give career missionaries a platform to speak, that are committed to evangelizing the Muslim world, that support higher numbers of long-term missionaries, and that provide more financial support for long-term missionaries. By contrast, mission pastors who participated uh, in the highest number of short-term mission trips, whether or not they've done long-term, are more likely to strongly affirm the state that God's instrument of mission is the local church, not the mission agency. That statement, I heard a lot of mission pastors articulate, so I put it in the survey, and there was a high proportion that created that uh, opposition. God's instrument is the local church, not the agency. Now, I'm Wycliffe background. My bias is Bible translation is a part of a mission, and God's instrument, the Bible translation, is not a North American congregation. It's highly specialized uh, uh, people with SIL, with the Bible translators, American Bible Society. Anyways, I don't like the opposition, but it certainly is a strongly thought. But there's a shifting theology that is that is a theology claiming we ought to be the central decision makers and control of the resources for mission. I'm sure my bias. Okay, come down. They are more likely to serve in churches that a higher number of church to church partnerships abroad, that support higher numbers of national Christian workers abroad, and if you've been on the mission passage, goes on a lot of trips, that church is also giving more money abroad. Cause and effect can be explored for the reasons. Mega churches are at the forefront of shifts in the social organization of missions, with the locus of agency and decision making shifting back towards the sending congregation and its leadership. A number of issues can naturally be raised. Responsiveness to new social realities. A whole paper could be done on this. One can make a compelling case that American congregations are responding to new social realities to which older mission agencies sometimes fail to appropriately adjust. And that much of this ministry is deeply responsive to brothers and sisters in Christ, such as in Santo Domingo, uh, the Willow Creek's partnership with uh, Robert Guerrero's church, for example, serving under uh, circumstances where uh, my kind of partnership can be, can be helpful. Um, that is, there may be things that are happening here that really are very healthy and very responsive to new realities. Issues of stewardship. While historic missions giving was that portion of giving which was altruistic. When I give to support my church, that's not altruistic. That's where my kids are going. That's the youth benefits. That benefits me and my life, etc. But if I give to support a Wycliffe missionary, a one of the Gichi Gumi, that doesn't, but it, it's purely altruistic. Uh, this is more than historical pattern. No benefit to the giver of giving church. Increasingly, missions giving is directed towards the dual goal, so meeting the needs of the givers uh, and their children, and the sending church while also serving others abroad. In part, this means that any sorts of ministry uh, which the American congregation as an organizational form is unsuited to fulfill, like Bible translation, and doesn't benefit by, is less likely to now be supported. The issue of whose needs are being met through these new patterns of stewardship needs to keep being asked. Who benefits? Issues of power. American congregations channel enormous amounts of material resources in the global mission in ways where control of money rather than wisdom and contextual understanding become the determinants of decision-making and power. Issues of wisdom. When the locus of decision-making and power moves from the field to the North American congregation and its leadership, there are deep questions of whether contextual wisdom underpins the patterns of global ministry being forged. The role of the missions pastor. In the world of global missions, the mission pastor is the new, in the history of mission, this is a, this is a new creation, a key person in the modern world that we haven't been tracking with. Absolutely strategic person. 
Each mega church mission pastor plays a central role in, on average, in deciding how $690,900 per year will be spent for a global mission. They are gatekeepers to all who seek support. The mission pastor is the person who educates, who casts the vision for mission, who provides leadership of an enterprise increasingly being directed from the North American congregational base. This is, uh, this is as a community, mission pastors uh, overall are not strong, missiologically, not strong linguistically. The need for missiology to connect with and inform this new leadership. Mission pastors are currently not well trained missiologically. Some of them are. But missiologists themselves, people like myself who might want to part from a distance, we have not done our research and writing with mission pastors and with youth pastors and so on in mind. And missiology programs have not been organized to be responsive to and helpful for the person with a mission pastor or youth pastor job description. If there were time I could talk about what we're trying to do the in this respect. We desperately need this changes in missiology so that mission pastors will find missiology to be helpful and responsive to the job descriptions that they have and the realities that they live in. 